so many uh, students, uh, alums and friends of geography here at our fourth annual uh, Richard J. Howe Memorial Public Lecture in Geography. Uh, my name is Yoon Haig, I'm the current chair of the Department of Geography. And I just want to say a few words to remind you of Richard Howe's uh, legacy and the foundations upon uh, which we have built. Uh, he founded the Department of Geography in 1948 and subsequently established the DePaul Geographical Society. For many years, he was the Department of Geography here at DePaul. Upon uh, Professor Howe's passing in 2012, we established this memorial series of lectures to, for, to keep people who had been friends with Dr. Howe engaged with the department and also to introduce uh, students and recent and future alumni to those who have gone before them. And this is a special year for us. Not only do we have a new dean, Dean Vasquez de Blasco, who will be speaking momentarily, but also the American Association of Geographers in 2016 awarded our undergraduate program its Excellence Award, uh, the only one in the United States to receive that award in 2016. So we are delighted to be recognized by our peers for the excellence of our undergraduate geography program. Um, Of course, this recognition, we wouldn't be here without uh, Dr. Hack. So again, it's on that foundation that our current excellence is built, and I would like to welcome you all to the campus today. A couple of other quick housekeeping points. Firstly, uh, if you drove here and are parked in one of the parking garages, uh, either myself or uh, our assistant, uh, Sheila Sullivan, or Julian Elder from the Geographic Society of Chicago have a parking pass that will get you $4 off. So that's a pretty good deal. So see, see one of us and uh, we can get you uh, the little parking pass. Secondly, uh, the restrooms, if you're not familiar, if you go out of this door, take an immediate right and right again, they're basically behind the wall out there. So they're, they're just parallel to where we are. And thirdly, uh, after uh, Matt Wilson's presentation, we will be repairing to the back of the room uh, for lunch. And there'll be a buffet lunch served back there. And please, um, you're very, very welcome to stay. We'd be delighted to, to meet with you, to chat with you, and get to know some of the students and faculty here at the hall. So please, we'd love to extend an invitation to all of you to uh, join us for, for lunch. Uh, with that, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Dean Vasquez to the Velasco, who will introduce our speaker. Good morning, and uh, thank you so much for this uh, invitation to welcome our distinguished speaker today. Uh, Dr. Matthew W. Wilson is an Associate Professor of Geography at the University of Kentucky and a visiting scholar at the Center for Geographic Analysis at Harvard University. Uh, he's uh, co-founded and uh, is co-director of the New Mappings Collaboratory. I try hard to kind of connect all of that there, uh, which studies uh, the, and facilitates uh, new engagements uh, with geographic representation. Uh, he has uh, previously taught at the university, uh, at Harvard Graduate School of Design, which uh, I must say is uh, ranked year after year as the number one school of design in the nation, in the nation. and uh, is currently uh, 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 research examines mid 20th century digital mapping practices. Uh, he earned his uh, PhD and uh, his MA from the University of Washington and his BS from uh, Northwest uh, Missouri State University. He has uh, published and presented in many, many venues and uh, among uh, uh, some of the journals he has published in, we find uh, Society in Space, uh, Landscape and Urban Planning, uh, Geoforum, uh, The Professional Geographer, uh, the Annals of the Association of American Geographers, um, Cartografica, that sounds very Spanish, probably messing up with that one, 
uh, social and cultural geography, gender, place, and culture, and environment and planning. Uh, his uh, latest book, uh, titled uh, New Lines, a Critical GIS in the Trouble of the Map, is forthcoming from the University of Minnesota Press. So uh, please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker this morning, Dr. Wilson. So, so what, what I want to explore with you today is, uh, is a kind of provocation that, that I experience quite often uh, in my own field, uh, where I'm being asked and challenged about whether or not I actually use GIS. Right? I'm, I'm a trained critical human geographer who focuses on GIS science, uh, which is a slightly different configuration than, say, a GIS scientist who engages in critical human geography. So I've got kind of a different, you might say, melange of things going on. Uh, in, in my academic background. So this is, a, this is a question that I think provokes some thought on my part of you know, my own background and training and why that's unique. But I also think it leverages an interesting question toward higher education. And what I want to do today is just sort of go through some, some thoughts I've been having about uh, higher education, about the role of geography within higher ed, uh, and the role of GS science within geography departments to advocate on behalf of, of a discipline we know and love. So, I want to begin from this premise 
that uh, the practices that we understand as mapping and as GIS, that these practices matter, not only because of the knowledge they represent or the kinds of expertise that they foster, but because there's an incredible role that maps serve in society. And I think we see this. We open up our, our smartphones. It's hard to avoid uh, the role that location-based services and mapping serve in society. But I want to argue that the question of that role and responsibility that comes with mapping, that comes with GIS, that, that question of that role has largely been left to those who don't actually engage in mapping themselves. Right? People outside of GIS fields wage the question about whether or not we should be using GIS, what are the sort of social and ethical implications of making maps, of maps used to wage war, to, to basically uh, engage in gentrification and displacement. There's an, there's an unending set of questions and moral dilemmas about the role of mapping, mapping in society. But I think that this question of the role of mapping in society has largely been left to people who don't actually make maps. I think there's something useful about thinking about that separation between the doing of GIS as a method in map making and the studying of GIS and mapping as an object. Right? There's, a, there's an interesting separation between doing and studying that happens somewhat artificially uh, within geography departments. And for me, I think that separation perpetuates a kind of irresponsibility within geography departments to separate method from study. And I want to talk about that today. My title, But Do You Actually Do GIS, is my kind of shorthand for thinking about this separation. However, my students remind me that this question could also be more simply asked, do you even GIS, bro? Uh, all right. The effect, the effect of these two questions are largely the same. They call into question, I think, what it means to engage in technological work, what it means to engage in front of a computer screen, what kinds of individuals, what kinds of projects are imagined at the heart of that practice. For me, to ask this question is to create an interior and an exterior, to draw a line between people who are considered experts and people who are considered amateurs, between professionals and hobbyists. So in, in what remains of, of this lecture that separates you from lunch, I want to understand how the changing role of GI science in the contemporary academy actually reflects some of these new opportunities, these new challenges that come with our math immersed world. So this is, uh, as, as my, my introduction is sort of announced, this is from a broader project titled uh, New Lines, Critical GIS and the Trouble of the Math. This is my sort of plug. For a, for a book that's coming out next year with the University of Minnesota Press. It's exploring what I call a variety of map troubles, uh, both the kinds of specific problems to which maps have often been called to solve and provide solution, but also the kinds of troubles that maps cause themselves, right? So oftentimes we think about maps as resolving trouble, but I want to think about the ways in which maps actually create some trouble. Trouble, I think, is, is fun to think about. Trouble. Uh, forces new thinking, it forces new action. Trouble can be fun. I see, you know, my buddy uh, John Lewis from Ball State University, where I previously talked, we've gotten into some trouble together. Uh, trouble often involves risk. Uh, the book uh, tries to take up these different guises of trouble and tries to evaluate those kind of creative opportunities that come with taking risks, with getting into trouble with maps. And here I'm reminded of, of Donna Haraway's recent project, and she writes, quote, our task is to make trouble to stir up potent response to devastating events, as well as to settle troubled waters and rebuild quiet places. But today I want to begin from within my GIS classroom, and already this requires a little bit of unpacking. The GIS classroom in the contemporary university expands and contracts. For the student, this may mean that learning occurs in large lecture theaters in order to uh, encounter these sort of growing enrollments within increasingly austere universities, or within smaller computer labs, or in the form of experiential learning uh, with mobile devices in the streets of our cities, or as increasingly mediated by the latest and greatest in classroom management systems. Right? At Kentucky, we just made a multi-million dollar purchase of Canvas. I don't know what you use here at DePaul, but uh, we, we celebrated the demise of Blackboard, and went to find out new overlord is uh, just as despotic. Okay. <laughs> So my classroom involves all of these sorts of spaces in the teaching of GIS and mapping, but they involve other spaces as well. Often my students uh, go to the archives, they visit art museums, 
map collections. We watch, of course, YouTube videos, great, great response, uh, and Twitter back channels. This is sort of not unusual within geography departments. We find and cobble together whatever is necessary uh, to sort of keep students engaged and learning about our dynamic planet. The trouble for me is how to ensure technical training in the drawing and the tracing of maps while also ensuring that there is responsible and responsive use of that expertise. How do you ensure that our students are adequately trained in the technical uh, needs of mapping and GIS while making sure that they're doing responsible use of those tools? How do we make sure that they're making responsive use of those skill sets? And students, I think, sense this kind of trouble between the technical and the critical. One student evaluator has written, I took this course expecting technical training in mapping software. The course turned out to be more theory and human geography based. Our project, however, immersed me into real world GIS applications. While it may not be technical, it has still been a great experience. However, another student, enrolled in the same course, writes, great teacher, bad course. Drop 95% of a theory, history, influence on culture and research. If you want that, make a separate class. I think this sort of illustrates the kinds of tensions in our classrooms around doing and studying. For me, this friction and the rub between these two kinds of student evaluations reflects a broader trouble of the university. These tensions call attention to our competing visions for higher education between the role of liberal education and the role of a more vocational education. Universities tend to speak in code around these kinds of tensions. They use words like utility. Its expression in the classroom acts as a piece of rhetoric that serves to justify decisions regarding the role of a particular curriculum. Also heard among university administrators, as well as its close relation to the word relevance, it works to legitimate decisions uh, about recruitment, about staffing and faculty in the midst of a series of crises of confidence in higher education. Public scholarship, university engagement and outreach. Indeed, campuses and the scholarship they support are impacted by these very basic expressions. Immersive learning. Either bolster support for scholarly activities that fit the current model of the academy, or change the conversation. Arguably, many institutions of higher education attempt the former, reorganizing their university structures to better capture resources. Performance-based budgeting. There are winners and there are losers caught in the lines, in the lines between these expressions. Witness the class of departments within the liberal arts, such as classics and languages, amid the growth of athletic department budgets and expenditures on various forms of edutainment on our college campuses. But do you actually do GIS? Loaded in that question is a series of assumptions about what it means to practice map making. And I think we can do more to broaden our vision of that practice as both technical and critical. This, of course, I think necessitates a shift in undergraduate and graduate programming, as well as changing the conversation around who and what kinds of faculty we recruit to our departments. In many ways, private industry is more at ease with these shifts than the academy, as organizations that foster geospatial research and development demand a more interdisciplinary vision for these knowledge workers. To be relevant, and to be utilizable, indeed to be practical, should not have to come at the expense of being contextual, being creative, radical, and even critical. Those who ask this question likely expect weighty results on the implementation of this or that mapping technology, or at least a heavier dose of, dose of geotechnical jargon, like KML files and geojsons and uh, interoperability. I understand their confusion, right? I understand their confusion. I introduce myself very much as a GI scientist, especially when I'm asking for money. But I'm one that studies the use of GIS. I'm not just a GI scientist. I'm interested in the study of the use of these forms of software. And as, as a result, my work is largely evaluated by my peers within a subfield called critical GIS. While other GI scientists likely don't even recognize me in conferences, cite my work, or include me within the fold. Again, I understand, in the context of blunt comments that leverage questions of utility and relevance, GIS does appear on the winning side of that conversation. Yet the hybrid position of being a scholar that studies GIS as an object and also teaches courses in GIS is a bit perplexing, I think, for some. But why? 
I suggest that these kinds of conversations around utility and relevance are conditioned by the very specific history of geospatial technologies within geography departments, particularly in the United States. And I argue that those of us in the discipline need to do better to change the questions that invoke value in the academy, to make the strange and those perplexing positions more familiar. To reiterate, this is a question about what we value in the academy. What kinds of scholarship? What kinds of training? What kinds of inquiry? Too often we allow the urgent questions of our time to be addressed within disciplinary silos. Instead, to shift our notions of value and significance, to understand how to make maps more resonant. It's going to require our best sciences, our best arts, our best humanities, a widening of our interdisciplinary opportunities, and an invigoration of the liberal arts in a new generation of engaged scholarship. But there are already key indicators that this reorganization of value is already afoot. The increasing availability of and innovations in internet-based digital mapping tools have brought about rapid changes in the mapping world. Alongside the popularization of mapping has been largely silent uh, academies as to what these developments might mean for cartography, GI science, geography, and spatial thought more, more broadly. Meanwhile, the arts, the humanities, design disciplines, the social sciences, including critical human geography, had marked their interest in the use of geospatial tech, with the emergence of new forms of map art exhibitions, renewed academic subfields like the digital and the spatial humanities, as well as calls for new collaborations between the critical social sciences and the GI sciences. In other words, the disciplines associated with this kind of melange that we call and love as geography are being appropriated and being repackaged under a new reorganization of value in the academy. To put it overly bluntly, they are eating our lunch. The position I advance in this book project is that those of us already at the borders of the discipline must take a hard look at the mirror, at our new kinds of challenges, our new conceptual challenges for the critical engagement of mapping technologies. My little corner of the discipline in geography takes up these challenges and travels under the name of something called critical GIS. And I'm, I'm very proud to, to admit that I'm starting to slowly see new forms of faculty recruitment under this name, and certainly new undergraduates and graduate programs that are trying to pick up on some of this curriculum. But for me, this kind of uh, scholarship is really sort of born out of the late 1990s, uh, and is referred to an area of research position at this kind of intersection between critical human geography and critical geography and uh, GI science drawing together some of the fantastic technical capacities that come with our digital world with the critical capacities of social theory and recently the digital humanities. This kind of critical GIS scholarship is particularly influenced by participatory action researchers, the histories of cartography and GIS, and the inclusion of more radical, more local, everyday counter cartographies. It grew through feminist geographies and feminist geographers' insistence on the conditions of knowledge production. It grew through their ideas about representation and the promotion of alternative methods and alternative epistemologies. It inherits a focused attention to the social and the political implications of mapping technologies that come from the GIS and society tradition, while being cognizant of the technical debates and the intricacies of these tools. The distinct practices of critique and application are not necessarily oppositional, but we treat them as such. We treat these as oppositional forms of method. Indeed, one historicization of critical GIS might point to the emergence of this field as a solution to the kinds of deconstructive attitudes towards GIS in the early 1990s. In other words, according to this narration, these kinds of scholars sought to take action, to respond to the critiques of GIS by doing the technology differently. Now, of course, some of these critiques were actually found to deactivate the technology itself. For instance, in calls to recognize the use of GIS in military violence and US imperialism, this might be read as a call to dismantle the technology itself, or in the least, try to disrupt the complicities of the discipline of geography to yet another project of colonial imposition. Here, Neil Smith, argues in 1992 that GIS was contributing to, quote, the killing fields in the Iraqi desert. Still others found an opportunity in developing the science of geographic information systems, crafting a subfield that could capture the scholarly work of both developing technology, 
its interface, its programming structures, its tools, and applying that technology to new research questions in the social and natural sciences. Or in Stan Openshaw's words from the same time period, to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Humpty Dumpty here being the discipline of geography. However, the disciplinary angst of the 1990s, and here I think about smells like teen spirit and nirvana, this kind of like angsty moment of the 1990s, uh, is differently urgent today. What was a question of the diminished role of geography in the university is now amplified as a general crisis of the role of higher education in society. There is a need for strong public scholarship to capture the imagination and recapture the trust of society. There is a need for geographers, right? A need for geographers to be uniquely positioned. And it's our distinct ability, I think, to tack between a critique of knowledge and the application of knowledge uh, that should earn society's trust. For me, it's long past time for geography to reevaluate its relationship to GIS. In doing so, I think there are two presuppositions that seem obvious to those of us outside of the discipline. The first is that as systems of geographic information GIS encompasses a wide range of technologies. This includes more traditional understandings of GIS as a desktop software right, that, that we know and love as Esri's ArcGIS, as well as a range of distributed, mobile, cloud-based, and so-called Map 2.0 technologies, such as Google Earth, Google Maps, satellite navigation systems, smartphone mapping applications, something called location-based services, on and on, all the way to sort of like Tinder, uh, Snapchat and Yik Yak, all of which are sort of built upon some of these basic GIS technologies. For me, the bindings around what we call GIS has to be loosened. Uh, we have to sort of encounter and work with these other forms of uh, technoculture. Second, this broadening of what we call GIS requires a renewed intellectual apparatus to both theorize and practice the technologies of geographic representation. In other words, significant shifts have occurred uh, around these kinds of technologies, beyond new software, beyond new hardware capacities and capabilities. Rather, I call these shifts kinds of technocultural shifts. It's not just about the change in technology. It's about the change in our cultures of use of that technology. How we make use of these tools has indeed changed. For me, these two basic presuppositions force four uh, kinds of agenda items here that I think we need to grapple with as a discipline. For me, this has to deal with an interrogation of the very specific social, political, and economic conditions that enable our contemporary notions of GIS, right? Who is benefiting from the creation of this software? Who is pocketing money on the backs of our uh, location-based services on our mobile devices? We have to ask these kinds of questions. We can't leave them to the sociologists. Uh, geographers have to be here to answer these questions. Number two, the critical GIS is an evaluation of the concepts that inform or assume by contemporary GIS practices. I think it's time to revisit questions of representations uh, that is born from feminist geography. We have to revisit ideas of collaboration and participation. What does it mean uh, when the developing world has greater access to mobile devices around mapping uh, than some of our most distressed cities in North America? For, uh, for, uh, thirdly, I think we need to sort of re-examine the ways in which GIS is enrolled. Right? We need to figure out how these things are being enrolled, whether or not that's location-based services via our various online dating apps, or geo-intelligence, the use of drones, and new forms of geospatial uh, software design that's focused on uh, gathering state intelligence, or things like crowdsourced citizen science, or the new buzzword in urban planning around the smart city. Right? We have to reevaluate our relationship to these and not allow other disciplines to sort of uh, take control of this form of geographic inquiry. Fourthly, critical GIS for me has always been about this production of new practices, of new postures toward technology. It's about developing alternative pedagogies of not just using the recipe system for teaching our GIS, of trying to figure out how to build in community-based mapping, not because we believe we can serve the community, because that's a very specific fiction advanced by recruitment in universities, but because it is our responsibility as neighbors of these communities to open our doors and to allow community mapping uh, to become part of our uh, infrastructure. All right, so to engage in these kinds of critical GIS research is to do more, I think, than to shift attention uh, within GIS science or even within geography. 
Instead, I think there's an opportunity here to reach beyond the disciplinary interests of geography and GI science and curate a new form of collective focus, a leaning forward toward the mattering of planetary survival itself. Being asked the question, but do you actually do GIS, unearths a series of broader concerns. Its posturing is indicative of a growing, nagging skepticism of the project of higher education. We can see this by just turning on the 24-hour news cycle. It has a particular impact on our academic departments and the kinds of scholarship that we are encouraged to pursue. To fashion a response to this question has meant reconsidering what it means to be public, as well as what it means to adopt scientific principles and why those are so important to the delicate form of our democracy. We need to reestablish the significance of studying versus doing. We need to reestablish why these things uh, are separated in various ways, but trying to figure out why they make sense together, uh, especially within the relative privilege of the academy. We have to follow these lines while always reading between them. The new lines we draw and the lines which draw us in are pretty gritty. In this kind of project, I speak of lines not only as metaphors for directionality or borders or boundaries, nor as a kind of literal drafted line on a map manuscript. Rather, the lines we draw and the lines that draw us in are of differing qualities. They are continuities. Gilles Deleuze writes of the significance of thinking and qualities, not in oppositions, and here he writes, there is not simply the opposition of earth and water, of the one and the many. There is the transition of the one into the other, and the sudden upsurge of the other out of the one. To conceptualize these lines, these lines of studying and doing, uh, we have to rethink them as both thick and thin, drawn and traced, merely transitions between qualities uh, as a way to sort of sidestep this question around uh, the crisis of representation, to sidestep questions between objectivity and subjectivity, between perception and partial perspective, between science and belief, indeed between the virtual and the real. Too often we allow these oppositions to calcify, to kind of create hardened structures that actually make little sense to the world outside of our, of our campus. We have to think about new ways to incorporate GIS and geography into resolving these kinds of basic questions. For me, this requires a bit of rethinking. For instance, take Brian Harley's statement from 1989, cartography is seldom what cartographers say it is. Now, while not a theorist, Brian Harley recognized that just below the surface of the map, the practice of cartography was both more and less than how it was being studied and enacted. I want to think about this statement differently, because I think this is, uh, this is a particular kind of suspicious attention that, that Harley gives. It, sort of, it indicts cartographers uh, as not really knowing what they're doing. I think we should, we should rethink this 1989 uh, statement. For me, I want to think about this as cartography is as cartographers are. Arthur Robinson, the leader of mid to late 20th century thinking in cartographic pedagogy, understood the importance of the cartographer's craft and how to use scientific rigor to refine and innovate that craft. His work suggests the importance of experimenting with visual strategy in order to develop the best practices regarding geographic representation itself. In his dissertation, The Look of Maps from 1952, he writes of map design, Quote, the one aspect of map structure which seems to have definite possibilities for objective visual evaluation is the projectional. Heretofore, almost the entire literature on projections has been concerned with mathematical phases. Only recently has the visual problem become significant in the selection of projections. So I want to not so quickly dismiss this idea of objective visual evaluation. It motivates a lot of contemporary scholarship on cartographic behavior, what we now call map use research. I suspend this disbelief in order to sort of think about the objective gaze, in order to learn how evaluation functions in our discipline. Indeed, when Robinson wrote Elements of Cartography in 1953, uh, he was writing a textbook that would define the better half of the 20th century. It went through six editions from 53 to 1996, and it, it educated generations of cartographers since then. But it, it, it holds at this, at this core this kind of notion of objective visual evaluation. For me, I think there are other effective modes that are often alighted in this kind of map use research. I think many in this room have often had experiences with maps that would evade a simple objectivity. Let's look at three examples. In this photo taken from training materials uh, in New York City in, back in the early 2000s, 
we see a group of citizens convened to be trained in the use of a mobile device to map the quality of life of their neighborhoods. And while my earliest research was attempting to try to resolve uh, the ways in which these kinds of rooms and these kinds of technologies uh, enforced who belonged on the city sidewalk, I want to think about something very specific in this image that we see all the time. Namely, that there are certain moments uh, in these kinds of conversations where individuals feel compelled, consciously or not, to lean forward in their seats toward the image before them. A few rows back to the left of the photo, a woman tilts her head uh, toward the front of the room, signaling perhaps from your presence in the room or an act of listening, a visible engagement within a family of nonverbals like the nod or the furrowed brow. These kinds of moments, which I would call effective moments, might be called mapping interactions. They're not so easily understood or objectively measured, despite several decades of behavioral research on map use. These kinds of moments, the tilting toward the map in front of us, resist taxonomy. They make mischief, they make trouble of objective visual evaluation. They are only ever transitions, repetitions, forces of one object against another. Here's another project. Rebecca Krinke's project, Unseen Scene, the Mapping of Joy and Pain, from the University of Minnesota, highlights a kind of analog and deeply tangible process of engaging in the emotions of representation. Participants added color to these maps outside of their uh, neighborhoods. They tried to figure out how to map uh, their feelings of joy and their feelings of pain in the Twin Cities. Here they lean in, they discuss, they debate, they contest, and they celebrate. These moments are prized and elaborated in the psychogeographic projects to include map walks and field papers and other forms of drifting and derives through the city. Similarly, in this project of a mapping uh, participatory activity that I helped facilitate in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, we see these same kinds of interactions with maps. These are not forms of objective visual evaluation. These are people responding to place by putting their thoughts and feelings directly onto the map. They resist a simple kind of objective measure. Here, after going on a short, timed, and unguided walk, participants uh, trace this project projected map with their fingertips and place their thoughts, their feelings, and their projections directly onto the map surface itself. These traces become new lines, new encounters, new interrogations, more than simply new representations. It's not about a singular truth of the world around us. It's about how we form connective attachment to place and how maps facilitate those kinds of connective attachments. These new lines, for me, thicken that moment of representation. It's never just about uh, representing the real. They both assemble our thoughts and actions, and they aid in the dispersal. The point is that we need to attend to these thickenings, to recognize that the inequitable qualities of engagement with the map will always resist objective visual evaluation. To return to the Lozo Matari, one never knows in advance how a line will turn. Politics is an experimental activity. Make the line break through, says the accountant, but that's just it. The line can break through anywhere. We lean toward the map in front of us because it compels us. Maps move. They organize bodies. They channel. They focus. They damage and they recover. At times, we experience and craft maps as solvents. In other moments, they're more plastic, they're more fleeting, they're more ephemeral. The potential of mapping lies in this kind of slippage between solids and plastics. And the decade plus of research in public participation GIS has taught me that. Legitimacy is something you craft, you cannot inherit it. And yet the space of potential radical engagement through cartography has become crowded. We are not in just the company of a few critical and participatory mappers. Instead, as the rise of new mapping players in the geospatial industry and the new applications of critical human geography and mapping indicates, the space of potential in mapping is not entirely, nor was it ever perhaps, ours for the making. Witness the emergence of geospatial intelligence, the, with the use of qualitative inquiry uh, to gather strategic intelligence on uh, in developing contexts, uh, and, and the incredible explosion of new mapping industries in, in companies like Pardo, Mapbox, uh, and indeed Esri. The crafting of legitimacy in these spaces, the making of new lines, is ever more complicated. 
Far from allowing these developments to simply wash over us and return to our recipe books for how to use ArcGIS, we have to come to a new understanding of the role of our discipline. However, those of us in the academy have become distracted as well. In the context of lump comments that invoke utility or relevance in our classrooms, GIS does appear to be on the winning side of those conversations, although perhaps not critical or counter in approach. So inasmuch as we need to draw attention to the various industrial tensions and the industrial pressures on mapping in our classrooms, we also need to shift the registers of what counts as important, of what counts as relevant pedagogy in our departments. We need to change this conversation without abandoning the incredible innovations in and outside of the classroom. Geographers for the better part of two decades have leaned upon the popularity of geospatial technologies in providing signposts for a curious and even skeptical public about the value of a geographic education. The saturated language associated with geospatial ed mined sentiments that surrounded the advocacy of GIS in departments back in the early 1990s. In other words, we oftentimes tell ourselves that GIS will save the discipline. However, this sentiment has, a, has extended beyond the confines of geography departments and has been further hailed as a way to resolve the crises of the humanities and of the social sciences in the wake of pressures to do something, do something, be public, to be both utilizable and relevant. If you do a basic online search of the, the word relevance within websites like the Journal of Higher Education or the Chronicle of Higher Education, You'll get a sort of persistent conversation over several years that parallels the discussion of the sustainability of departments uh, as well as the viability of specific disciplines. However, in a limited way, these kinds of pressures about how to invoke value in the academy come to us preformed in K through 12 education. And that's not just sort of shift blame to K 12. But for instance, even changes in standardized examinations for college admissions highlight the shifting registers of collegiate knowledge that is both expected and fostered. And this is, a, this is a quote from the New York Times a few years ago. Every year, the SAT reduces more than a few teenage test takers to tears. But few questions on the so-called big test appear to have provoked more anxious chatter, at least in this era of texting and online comment streams and discussion threads, than an essay prompt in some versions of the SAT administered last Saturday, in which students were asked to opine on reality television. That students were asked to react to and discuss reality television as indicative of more than new attempts to assess writing and thinking uh, should give us some pause, right? Why is reality television being used as a primary method by which students uh, can show their writing and analytical skills? Indeed, in this passage indicates much more sinister developments, central to the fashioning of what society considers general knowledge. To ask students to develop an opinion on things like drone warfare, around foreign policy, or around global economic crises, would be to complicate the evaluation of basic thinking and writing skills. We simply can't ask our high school students to have an opinion on drone warfare. It would, it would be too overcomplicated to assess their writing and thinking. Instead, American youth are said to have kept up with the Kardashians, and therefore can be expected to have thoughts and even arguments uh, to wage and respond, right? They, they are not expected to have you know, thoughts and arguments on a global economic crisis, but we can expect them to have thoughts and even arguments uh, about the Kardashians. This is, I think, a most curious crisis. In this context, we can place the attenuation of geographic attention. While the technological conditions of the map flourish, we have more access to maps than we ever have in human history, and yet, we seem perpetually lost. What about being relevant? What about being utilizable in the classroom and champions the map and the use of GIS, and yet has left us feeling literally and figuratively lost as a society? Within higher education, budgetary models reward units that fill classrooms, the butts in seats model. The implications for this are felt most strongly, perhaps, within the languages and the humanities where the development of critical thinking of language skills requires a more favorable ratio of faculty per students. Even still, the humanities are encouraged to modularize their lectures and classroom activities, incentivizing a move that attempts to economize faculty labor and often simultaneously distill the content of a lecture into action and uh, an activity. But to reshape curriculum in this way is to also 
do so within the syllabus itself. And then, you know, those of you who are teaching sort of cringe whenever we start talking about this. Uh, we are often told through our teaching and learning centers on campus to develop active verb learning outcomes. To argue that students will learn, that students will understand, or that they'll know something, according to these regimes of syllabi authorship, are too conventional to attract students, as well as too abstract to be measured. So, sure, students will learn, perhaps even understand and know, but more savvy syllabi will foster action and practice. Students will do, not just know, is what we are told. Funding, as a result, is targeted at faculty to redesign their courses, to invert the classroom, to build in project-based learning, to partner with industry as well as community organizations, to co-teach multidisciplinary courses, all in order to prioritize learning that is actionable, to alleviate the concerns of parents and their student customers to the efficacy of a liberal arts education. Teachers will demonstrate, not just evaluate. I believe the GI sciences have benefited extremely from these pressures. Within this utility regime, the GI sciences are partnered and aligned with the humanities and social and natural sciences, as well as in professional fields of public health, medicine, engineering, architecture and design, etc. Coursework enhanced with GIS provides students with an opportunity to do in the classroom, shifting the underlying relationships between students, faculty, and a collegiate education itself. I want to think about the map as a political object, as an object that organizes and reorganizes our social life, from the classroom to the planet. To reclaim such an idea of the map through such a modest appreciation of its potential requires reworking those tensions that pull at the seams of our discipline. Not to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, as Stan Shaw put two decades ago, but to alter our targets of critique, to redraw the lines of continuity that might create new energies to inspire a curious public. So all this to say, yes, I do GIS. But this is to signal much more than a pushing of pixels across a screen. To do GIS is to engage in a series of trajectories that crisscross and constitute our digital maps. The possibility of critique, a reactive technological history of the map, and the fashioning of spatial representations that sustain a progressive attention. This will require more of us, both a greater involvement of geographers and non-geographers, but more importantly, we have to get out of this box, this out of this idea that GIS is only a uh, following of a recipe uh, to use our GIS. We have to think about how the map is so integral and important to our society. That a single point does not form a line summarizes this requirement for me. That a single point cannot form a line is a kind of manifesto for a renewal of critical mapping practice, recognizing that this work cannot reside only within a single point of an individual, and discipline, nor a subfield. Instead, this work, under these new forms of mapping conditions, must be part of an expanding constellation, where connecting the dots with new lines is the making plastic of our most prized map-making habits. Let's do some GIS. All right. Thanks, thanks for that for holding me on. science, we've allowed uh, the teaching of methods within our departments to define what kinds of questions we want to ask as a discipline. And I'm not comfortable in that situation anymore. Perhaps it's having tenure that has allowed me to feel a bit more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in general, I think, I think we have to sort of re, we have to reimagine, I think, what our discipline does. Yeah? So to the question and to the point, and as someone who oftentimes meets with incoming students or prospective students, where the question of, well, do you do GIS, has become, or has supplanted, um, do you do geography, or what is geography? Um, it's become sort of the dominant entree um, and justification and legitimization, um, influencing students' choice, their parents' choice, 
and even the school administrator of whether or not to pursue this particular business. I'd just like to hear your reflect on that. Yeah, no, I think uh, there's a lot of, it's a very complex sort of series of um, pressures, right? Uh, we feel it from upper administration, but we feel it from uh, the incredible rise in tuition costs just in the last 20 years that have reinforced for students and their parents this need to have uh, vocational education as a central piece of their time in college. And so I think it's not unusual for, for us to kind of gravitate in our discipline toward GI science. I think that's perhaps within our discipline, the way in which we advocate on the relevance of our discipline to higher, ed higher administration. Uh, but it's also the way that we communicate to parents and student customers uh, what they can do with this form of knowledge. Um, I don't want to say that we shouldn't have technical training. I think we have to have technical training. But I don't think that we should think of it as coming at the expense of our broader identity with the discipline. Uh, I think uh, you know, we, ha we, have to, we have to fashion these technical skills uh, not as an end to themselves, Right, but, but a means to a, a, a way of engaging with the world around us uh, that, that, uh, that will require uh, more than just time in the computer lab. It will require, it will require reading. It will require sort of uh, experience in, in project situations. Uh, but I, I do think we, we get them in the door, just as I became a jockey maker. We get them in the door because we communicate on the transferable skills of the GIS classroom to time after college. But once we get them in the door, we have to be much more, we have to inspire much more curiosity on what they do with that kind of technical training. Can I follow yeah. up? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, as a geographer, as a co academic, I agree with you entirely. But the fact that juniors and seniors from high school are arriving with those perceptions and with those questions already in mind suggests that there are external influences and external. Um, shaping of ideas about the discipline and about etc. And I guess, you know, it's, it's the persistent question today from incoming students. Um, the question being? The question being, do you do GIS? Yeah. Being, do you, Paul Geography, not necessarily me as a professor, but do you do, and depending on your answer and your explanation of it, it's a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Yeah. And I'll, I'm Thank you very much. I'll give you the next yeah. yeah, I think I think we have to say yes. We do GIS. That's that's you know absolutely right. And geography departments are not cross training their graduate students and their undergraduates in GIS and their methods. Uh, that we're doing a huge disservice to them. Uh, but I think we just have to sort of expand what we mean by GIS. Right. I think they need to understand uh, that. Uh, in order to understand questions of environmental and social crisis and catastrophe, we can't just find an open data set to plop into the ArcGIS data environment and print out a map that explains globalization. We have to sort of realize uh, that they're doing GIS, but they're doing GIS because they've taken all these other systematic courses in urban and cultural geography that provide them with the lens and the sort of fashion their way of asking questions about the wherein GIS and other forms of map representation can help them uh, in exploring and representing those, those questions. Right? So I, I agree with you. I think we have to we have to offer, we have to answer the question, yes, we do GIS. The department does GIS, our faculty do GIS. I think we have to be much more creative about what that doing incorporates. I think you know, we do it disservice, I know that in my own department we do a disservice when we call uh, our tract within our major the GIS tract. Uh, I would much rather there to be a distillation of GIS methods across a variety of different tracks, whether they are human environment, political, urban, cultural, right? These all have to incorporate at some level uh, forms of technical inquiry and forms of representation. Um, and I think if we, if, we, if we sort of silo off the GIS sciences, which we're being encouraged to do, right, because we want to develop certificates and online degree programs and et cetera, we want to be able to do that, right? Uh, we, we have to sort of expand what it means to be trained uh, in GIS. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. I, I really enjoyed your talk. This is a little farther away from the vocational question, but do you GIS? It seems still sort of a photographer to me. You, know, you talked a little bit about Maps 2.0, where it's no longer a photographer, it's a, it's a model. Yep. So how does that um, 
affect your, 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 your critical GIS field kind of broadly and be more specific to what you're getting at? Yeah, I think uh, so. So the kind of the MAPS 2.0 moment, right, is what in the GIS sciences we call volunteer geographic information. Uh, now, my critical human geography colleagues will kind of raise some eyebrows at this concept of volunteering of geographic information. Well, most of us know that we're producing a cloud of geospatial information regardless of our ability to volunteer to provide it, right? So I think uh, we're in this bizarre moment, I think, within the discipline where we, we have potentially uh, a, 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 an entire web of geographic information describing social and natural life. But it's not open to us, right? It's held by a handful of corporations in North America who have control over that mesh of digital information. That makes it really challenging uh, to be a geographer in 2016, when all the really active spatial analytic kinds of questions that could be asked about our social and natural life are not being asked in the academy because they can't have access to that data set. Right? They're being asked at Facebook, they're being asked at Google, they're being asked in some cases at Esri. Uh, so I, I think this is the challenge. Right? This is the challenge of geography in, in 2016 is that we've never been more capable as a civilization uh, to access geographic representations about everyday social and natural process. But we don't have access to the data, right? We don't have access to the data. Which, which, which sort of makes it difficult for us to, I think, answer questions of relevance and utility. Uh, when, we, when we're dealing with largely data sets that uh, are available to us, which are either uh, curated through very specific you know, agreements with major corporations, or are done on the backs of state agencies like the census. So I, I do think in this, in this Web 2.0 world, uh, we have to kind of dispel this myth that we have all of this data, that we can answer all these intricate questions. Because we can, but only a few of us can, right? And only a few of us with kind of the nudge and the elbow push can gain access to that kind of information. Um, that's the new political economy of data in 2016. Uh, and we've allowed that to kind of perpetuate. We have become complicit uh, in that, that structure of data. Right? We, we, many of us click agree on those terms and conditions, right? Without reading them, we are complicit in fostering an environment whereby our data are not ours, which means they can never be used in the realm of, of, the, of the academy. So we've undercut ourselves incredibly. I think we, I think we need to we kind of rethink this a little bit um, in order to sort of do geography in 2016. Yeah. Yes, I don't know how much this applies to this. Quite specifically, it's political maps and redistricting. And for example, one example is, is how the district has a specific map. Because we see the thing about the Latin kings and the, the Latinos. It's a specific legislative map in the state of Illinois, which linked up two areas that had Latino residents. And it's, the word chairman definitely fits that map. Shape. It's very long and narrow, goes west to its county line, slides south, of maybe just like along a road, and then goes back east and it covers both the Wilson area and the little village, I think probably the little village area, which is where the Mexicans are, and then you go to the north area where the Fort yes, Bacon comes. So then you have the lot, you know, the presenters of Congress. And that was one of the maps. And I think a lot of the map concerned that they were talking map amendment that they wanted to be doing later. Apparently ran into some weird problem involving constitutionality was having a organization that's not politically connected to draw maps. And the concern there for some of the people on the political side was that it was part problem for the minority representation. And does the GIS have things to do with making that sort of map? Absolutely, yeah. And I think I think within the within the, the history of cartography, there have been definite moments where uh, political decisions, either at the local level or at the geopolitical level, have been waged by how the map represents certain relationships. These are, right? these are not say city maps, but these are maps of the districts. Yep. Because some of the districts in Chicago or some of the suburbs, like the, the district I'm in, includes uh, I think. Lake Shore and holds in Evanston and Smoky, which is an area basically which is democratic compared to some of the other suburban districts, which yeah. are not so. Yeah. 
I think I think I think, I think what what we have to sort of recognize is that uh, the myth that the map is neutral or could be neutral uh, is indeed a myth, right? Maps uh, maps maps are, have a whole series of decisions that are made about what you represent and what you don't represent, right? And so we don't have to necessarily go to the example of gerrymandering or redlining uh, to see how maps are political, right? They're political to their core. Uh, and I think we have to sort of, we have to sort of rethink, um, we retrain ourselves about mapping. Arthur Robinson in the late 20th century was, a, was, a, was an advocate of visual techniques that would reduce bias in map information. Uh, and I think that's created this sense that the map is always a legitimate, authoritative, and value-free document. If we instead approach maps as ultimately works of art, right, with bias, with authorship, with decisions about what to represent and what not to represent, then I think we can have an actual, honest discussion about these kinds of situations of, of redlining in, uh, in Chicago or the conversations about relationships, uh, geopolitical relationships. We, we have to sort of recognize at the forefront that maps are only ever appearing neutral. Through very creative technique, they appear neutral, but they all have always had uh, a kind of political decision at their core. Uh, and I, you know, I think that the history of cartography in GIS, as it's taught in the later half of the 20th century, uh, has reinforced this myth that the map is neutral. Um, and we have to, I think, become much more savvy as map readers to recognize that the maps are, at their beginning point, a decision about what gets represented and what doesn't get represented. And that very simple question is a politically informed one. Um, and I think that's, you know, gerrymandering and redlining in the history of map making is a, is a great example disasters of believing that maps are neutral. <clears throat> we got uh, maybe a last question over here for two of those two hands up. Yeah. Now, okay. I wonder if you could comment a little bit on the emergence of geo design as a spatially um, animated attempt to reassemble architecture, urban planning, and landscape architecture. Uh, into a mega paradigm for imagining cities, the environment, uh, and the, this, uh, this movement, this, uh, this, uh, this paradigm has great support from corporate entities like Esri. Uh, and at least at this very early stage, it is unclear to what degree it is both understanding the critical or integrate them. But if it does become uh, a master paradigm in planning, then, then that question becomes more important. And I wonder if you're encountering conversations or red flags about geo design. Yeah. Because this is also something that is manifesting itself in curriculum. Really? Well. Yeah, I think uh, <coughs> geo, geo design, if, I, if I'm being a cynic, which I do more often than I probably should. Uh, if, I'm being a, if I'm being cynical here, uh, I don't think it would be hard to be able to see uh, the emergence of geodesign as a marketing brand at Esri with the decline of what used to be called multi-criteria decision making in the 1980s and 90s. It's hard to sell software called multi-criteria decision making. It's fancier to call it geodesign, right? Uh, but these are these the, the genealogy of geodesign goes back to the 1960s. It's an Ian McCard moment. It's a map overlay moment. It's what Carl Steinitz designed in the 1970s around the regional plan. Uh, but it's only, it's only Esri's fairly 21st century paranoia about losing market share in landscape architecture and architecture that has grown this idea, this concept, this brand of geodesign, starting with the Ge Geodesign Symposia that now occurs every year at Redlands, with multiple international workshops that are run by Esri uh, to teach geodesign. It's effectively what we called uh, you know, GIS-supported decision-making in 1975. Uh, but what, what has changed, I think, uh, in, in the realm of geodesign is uh, a greater attention to questions of social justice and inequality. Right? We, you know, we, have, we have an ability, like never before, to incorporate yeah. geosocial media and other forms of, kind of geosurveillance media. Uh, to begin to ask questions about the structure of our city streets, the structure of social relationships that occur through the built environment. And geodesign is a really whiz-bang, flashy way to 
put in people's faces uh, questions of social uh, and environmental injustice. So I do think there are, there are, there are incredible opportunities for use of this tool. Uh, its genealogy, its intellectual history, is a bit more focused on marketing, I think, than anything else. The, the questions have always been at the heart of uh, the marriage between GIS and planning. Uh, but it's only in the last 10 years that there's been any marketing buzzword associated with those questions. Uh, yeah, okay, well, and I'd like to take a moment and thank Professor Matt W. Wilson. Please join us for the buffet lunch, uh, help yourselves at the back of the room. I want to draw your attention to our next event, uh, which is on Thursday evening this coming week, upstairs on the third floor here, called Resisting Gentrification, the Young Laws in the Puerto Rican Struggle for Lincoln Park, with Professor Jackie Lazu and Jose Chacha Jimenez. Uh, all welcome um, upstairs on the third floor uh, to that interesting talk about what was happening on this campus uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, also, please remember, if you want to partner with Patsy, myself, or Julian Elder, or Sheila Sullivan, but again, thank you to Max Wilson, thank you all for joining us, and please uh, enjoy the lunch and continue the conversations.